Well, this morning we have the uh, opportunity to return to that uh, tremendous prayer, uh, the longest prayer that we have recorded of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Bible of any kind, and the prayer in which He prays specifically for His church. Remember, He is praying here for us. He's praying for you if you have trusted in Him. And what He prays here, as I've already told you, is that we would be preserved from everything that might threaten us in this world so that we might eventually make it to heaven. Now, we're going to read just the first part of that particular section where Jesus, as He has prayed several things now, begins to pray or make specific petitions for His church. Let's read verses 11 through 13 of this prayer. Jesus says, I am no longer in the world. And yet, they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing this morning. Now again, I I just want to take this a step at a time because there's so much here. Uh, I don't want us to really miss anything, but as much as we can to try to saturate ourselves with these wonderful truths. Now, Last time we we reminded that this prayer that Jesus offered up was not for the world. It was for those whom the Father had given Him, as we saw in Romans chapter 8, those whom God foreknew, those whom He predestined, those whom He called, and so forth. We also saw that the death that Jesus died, His laying down His life, His sacrifice, had precisely the same focus. He went to the cross for His people, not for the world. He went there for those whom the Father had chosen out of the world, for those whom He was to receive as a reward for His work. Now, we know that Jesus, as I've already mentioned, did these things for us, that He prays for us, that He laid down His life for us, if by His grace we are looking to Him in faith, and if in love, we are following after Him. So again, Jesus has been praying. He's been praying that God would give to Him grace uh, to do the work that He has called Him to do. He's praying that He would be able to complete that work, that He might be able to give eternal life. He's made it plain that He's praying specifically for His people, for His sheep, and now He begins by making His first request, and His request is this, that the Father would protect us. And give us the grace to persevere so that one day we would be with Him, that we would be one even as He and the Father are one. And again, Jesus intensifies that particular petition towards the end of this prayer. Now, we noted earlier that this prayer really forms the foundation of the church. Jesus prayed for the grace that He needed to finish His work that He might give life to His people. This is the founding of the church. And now He prays that the Father would keep, that He would guard those for whom He laid down His life. Now, this is the reason why we or anyone else that has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ will not eventually fall away and be destroyed forever. This is the reason, because Jesus prays for us. He pleads that work that He has done on our behalf continually before the Father. We see that shot throughout Scripture. And I've already read one example. Here we see it actually taking place on earth. Now let's consider three things this morning. First of all, we will persevere to the end because Jesus prays for us first. Secondly, that this is true only for those who actually belong to Him. And then thirdly, Jesus wants us to know that these things are true 
so that we might actually have joy in the midst of this world. So first of all, we will persevere to the end because Jesus prays for us. Now again, last time Jesus began to pray for His disciples, and here we see His first request. Since He was leaving, He prays that the Father would keep or protect His disciples. We read in verse 11, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are. Now, Jesus was departing, but they would remain behind. Jesus says again in verse 11, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. Now, the reason why Jesus, of course, was leaving them here was because their work was not yet done. Jesus had nearly uh, completed their training. Shortly, He was going to commission them to take the gospel to all the nations, and then He would empower them to do so. But, of course, in order to do that, they had to be on this earth. And knowing the dangers that they were going to have to face, Jesus prays for them. He says, Holy Father, keep them in Your name, the name which You have given Me, that they may be one even as we are. Now, that petition is rather a broad petition, but it includes at least these things, that the Father would protect them, particularly that He would protect them from those who would try to stop them from doing what it is that He had called them to do, and that, of course, would be primarily the world and the evil that is in the world. Now, we're going to look at that more specifically in verses 14 through 16 this evening. He prays that the Father would grant to them His Holy Spirit, I believe that's included in here as well, to strengthen them in love so that they would hold fast to Him and to one another, that they may be one even as we are one. The reason why they can be one is because of the Spirit of God. That is the oneness. It's a oneness of love, of unity, unity of purpose, unity of care and concern for one another. The same kind of love and concern the Father and Son have for one another is that love and concern He is giving to His people. So this is a prayer that the Father would provide the Spirit of God to give them this grace. And it's a prayer that the Father would protect them even from themselves, which is kind of interesting from the sin that is in their own hearts that could destroy them, but for the grace of God. Uh, we're going to look at that in the three verses that follow, the three verses we're going to look at, look at this evening. And ultimately, the goal of this prayer is that they would arrive in heaven where they would be able to enjoy the blessings of union with the Father and the Son and with one another forever for the rest of time. So in other words, this is a prayer that the Father would preserve them. I think that's probably a better word than persevere. I mean, the, the evidence that the Father is preserving us is that we are persevering in the things He has actually called us to do, in love, in, in faith, in, in obedience, in the work that He has given us to do in this world, and not letting uh, this fear stop us. This is the evidence that He is preserving us. Well, that's what Jesus is praying, that we would be preserved by the Father. Now, you know, up to this point, Jesus had been the one who had been doing this work. Look at what He says in verse 12, while I was with them, I was keeping them in Your name, which You have given Me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished. Now, we're going to stop the reading at that particular point. Now, Jesus had been their protector, and I think we see that throughout Scripture, don't we? We see Jesus, the shepherd of the sheep, always the one who is protecting the sheep, which is what a shepherd does. When they were faced with their enemies, He was the one who would stand in front, and He was the one who would stand up, and He is the one who would protect them. He wouldn't say, now surround me, disciples, go out in front of me, give your lives for me, and protect me. I'm behind you, you know, I'm entirely behind you. No, Jesus would stand out in front. He would be the one who would protect them. When they went astray, He would be the one who would correct them. He would keep them going in the right path. Uh, on one occasion when 
uh, Peter, well-meaning, uh, when Jesus had just said He was going to go to Jerusalem and He was going to be crucified, not so, Lord, that'll never happen to you. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You know, He rebukes him to his face. Why did He do that? Because He didn't love Peter? He was being mean to Peter? Sometimes we think rebukes are kind of a mean thing, but no, it's because He loved Peter and because He wanted Peter to do the right thing. And when the disciples got out of line, Jesus would... He would put them back in the right path. That's what a shepherd does for his sheep. That's what Jesus was doing to make sure they didn't perish, to make sure they didn't fall away, to make sure that they would make it to heaven. Well, now Jesus was leaving. And now that He's leaving, He prays that the Father would do this for them. And the way that He was going to do it was through His Holy Spirit, which He poured out on the day of Pentecost. Now again, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that Jesus here is making a transition from His earthly ministry to His heavenly ministry. On earth, He, he protected, He guarded, He did all of these things for his, his disciples, and He prayed for them while He was on earth. But now this ministry is being transitioned to heaven. Jesus has to do the same thing now from heaven, but He's going to do it in a different way. Now the Spirit of God, as He's already promised, is going to be the one who comes down to protect, to guard, and to comfort, and to rebuke, and to do all of these things. And Jesus is going to continue His ministry of prayer in heaven. And basically, that's what we have a picture of here. This is the kind of prayer that Jesus is praying for us now in heaven. Now, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, if you're trusting Him, if you love Him, as we've already seen, Jesus is praying for you. He's interceding for you. He is praying these things. He's praying that you will be kept safe from the world. He is praying that you will persevere to the end, that His Spirit would give you strength, give you grace to continue to love Him, to continue to love His Father, to continue to love His ways and to love His people and to hate this world and to follow after Him so that you will hold fast to Him. He is praying that you will have the power to overcome that sin that's inside of your hearts so that you won't fall away from Him, but you will make it to heaven where you will be with Him forever. Now, Jesus is praying for you that the Spirit will keep you, that He will guard you, and that is why you can know that one day you will be with Him. It's not because you know that you're going to make it to the end. You love Jesus so much that you're never going to fall away. Some people think the reason why they're going to make it to heaven is because they are going to walk the line that God told them to walk. They are going to love Him. They are going to be faithful to Him. They are not going to fail Him, and they're going to do it all the way to the end. What is that? That's a works-based kind of faith. None of us have the power to do that. Now, the evidence that we're trusting in Jesus is that we will do that, but God is the one who is doing that in us. Not that we don't have any part of it, of course. You know, Paul said to the Philippians, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. The reason why we persevere is because Jesus is praying. The reason why we obey is because He's given us the power to obey. The reason why we love and will continue to love to the end is because He is keeping the Spirit of God in our hearts. It's not because just of us. It's the work of God. And so that is our assurance that we will make it to heaven because, as Paul also reminds the Philippians, the work that he began in us, he will complete to the day of Jesus Christ. There's a promise that if he began that work, he will, he will complete it. He will bring it to its, its conclusion. We will make it. Now, that much uh, I think we've, we've heard and we understand, and I think we also understand this second part, but maybe there are some who don't. Second, we are again reminded that this is true only for those who belong to Him. Now, I already told you what Jesus said here does not apply to the entire world. As a matter of fact, it didn't even apply to all of His disciples. I doubt that, that any of us miss those sobering words that are contained in, in verse 12 which I, I broke the reading off just before last time, but let's read the whole verse now. He prays, while I was with him, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. And I guarded them, 
and not one of them perished but the son of perdition so that the scripture would, would be fulfilled. Now, those Jesus was guarding uh, did not perish, but there was one who did, and that was Judas. Now, just as Jesus prays for and lays down his life for those whom the Father has given him, for his sheep, for everyone who by his grace would believe in him, so he guards them, and they will never perish. But Judas perished, I want you to notice, because the Father did not give him to Jesus. He wasn't one of his sheep, and so he wasn't guarded by Jesus. Now, I think if there's one thing that's clear, it's clear that Judas never belonged to Jesus. It's true that Jesus chose him to be one of his disciples. But it's also true that Jesus said of Judas from the very beginning that he was a devil. Now we read in John chapter 6, uh, verses 70 and 71. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he one of the twelve was going to betray him. Just because someone might be chosen for a particular purpose in the Scripture does not mean that the purpose behind the choice is necessarily eternal life. Now, Jesus in our passage calls him the son of perdition, which means basically the son of destruction, the one who is headed to a final and complete loss. Jesus said that this would happen to Judas for the sin of betraying him. Now, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, verses 24 and 25, the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, said, Surely it is not I, Rabbi. Jesus said to him, You have said it yourself. So here, again, clearly, Judas, the son of perdition, the one who was a devil from the beginning, Jesus says basically here to him that he was going to go to hell. He was going to perish. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed that in this particular passage. You might just keep it up for just a moment. Here's a verse that you can add to your arsenal of Scripture when you run into somebody that does not believe in hell. And sadly, there are many people today who say that they believe the Bible, and yet they say they don't believe that hell exists. They read the Bible and they see that there's God in here and that God is a God of infinite love, and certainly that is true. But let's not forget that God is also a God of infinite justice and He must punish the wicked. He must punish each and every sin. He must send those who don't repent and trust in His Son to hell for their sins. Well, they don't believe God could do that. They believe God is a God of love and He could never make anybody suffer to that degree and to that length of time. Instead, they believe that unbelievers simply cease to exist. Basically, they're annihilated when they die. Well, I want you to notice here what Jesus says regarding Judas. It would have been better for Judas if he had never been born. Now, what's the difference between not existing because you were never born and not existing because you were annihilated? There's really no difference between the two. Jesus says it would have been better for Judas if he had never been born because now he is suffering in hell. If Jesus, what I'm saying is if Judas had never been born, he wouldn't exist. If Judas was going to be annihilated, he wouldn't exist. What's the difference between those two things? There's no difference between those two. But Jesus says it would have been good for him if he had never been born. And the reason is because once he was born and once he died in his sins, he is now going to have to suffer forever in hell. Now, I do want you to remember, too, or to bear in mind that Judas did not end up in hell just for this one sin. 
it would have been the penalty for any one of his sins outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. But of all the things that he did, this was certainly by far the worst sin of rebellion he committed against God when he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ for those pieces of silver. Now, something else I want you to notice. Judas was chosen for this particular purpose, to be the one who would betray Jesus. Jesus says in verse 12 that he guarded those who were his and none of them perished but the son of perdition so that the Scripture would be fulfilled. Does the Scripture say that Judas would betray Jesus? Well, it doesn't particularly name him, but it does say that he would be betrayed by one of his own. David writes in Psalm 41, verses 7 through 9, All who hate me whisper together against me. Against me they devise my hurt, saying, A wicked thing is poured out upon him, that when he lies down he will not rise up again. Notice, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Judas betrayed Jesus to fulfill this passage of Scripture. Now, I know that that raises some red flags, and we want to ask this question. Does that mean that God forced Judas against his will to betray Jesus? Does that mean he was singled out from all eternity to do this particular crime and that there was nothing else he could have done and that somehow we have this idea of determinism and that Judas was on his way to hell from the very beginning? Well, in a certain sense, it is true that he was because he wasn't one of those that God had chosen. He wasn't one of those that he had given to Jesus. It's not true that God forced him to sin against his will or to make any choices against his will. What Judas did, he did because he wanted to do this. Judas, you'll recall, was a thief, and he loved money, and he kept pilfering from the bag. And when he saw the opportunity to make some more money by betraying Jesus, he jumped at it because that was his heart, that was his nature, that's what he wanted to do. Judas did that because he chose to do that. God did not force him to betray Jesus. But ultimately, Judas perished because he wasn't one of Christ's sheep. He never trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this doesn't mean, the reason why I'm, I'm um, laboring this is because I want you to understand that Judas' betrayal of Jesus and his falling away does not mean that if you have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that the same thing can happen to you, that it's possible for you to fall away. It's because Judas never trusted Jesus because the Father never gave him to Jesus. He didn't pray for him. He didn't lay down his life for him because he does that for the sheep, and the sheep never perish. Judas perished. Judas was not one of Christ's sheep. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are safe. Remember what Jesus already told us in John 10, verses 28 and 29. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. That is the definition of what Jesus gives to his sheep, and whoever possesses that belong to his sheep. Judas perished. He doesn't belong to his sheep. That's, that's the point. Now, it doesn't, Jesus here isn't telling us that if we have trusted him, that we're in danger of falling away. That's not what he's saying. But what he is saying is that if you haven't trusted him, then you are in danger of falling away. You could fall into the same condemnation that Judas fell into. You could fall down into the same pit that Judas is in at any moment if you are outside of Jesus Christ. And the only reason you haven't fallen into that pit yet is because of God's mercy and grace. You know, Jonathan Edwards wrote a tremendous sermon on this called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he points out it's only by the good pleasure of God that anyone who is outside of Jesus Christ doesn't plunge right now into the fire. That's what everyone deserves. It's God's mercy and grace. And why does God, you know, continue to suspend people? Why does He hold them up at all? 
Well, it's because He's given you time to turn, time to repent, time to trust in His Son. So don't take that time for granted nor mistake that as God's approval on your life. I mean, yes, people sin and they don't plunge into hell right away. Does that mean that, God's, that God approves of what they're doing? No, it simply means that God is, is patient and He is giving time to repent. So don't take that time for granted. Turn to Him while there is the opportunity and receive the peace of knowing that you are safe in His hands. Now, the last point is a brief point, but I think it's, it's one that, that is, is interesting. Jesus prayed these things openly. He wanted His disciples to hear these things so that they could have joy. He says in verse 13, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Now, Jesus wanted his disciples to know that even though he would soon be leaving, that he was not going to leave them alone. He was going to be in heaven praying for them, praying that the Father would keep them, praying that they would be preserved all the way to the end, that they would persevere. He wanted them to know these things so that when they began to do what it is the Lord called them to do, and they had already begun that work. I'm not saying they hadn't. But after Jesus was gone, as they took that work up again and began to meet with the difficulties that they were eventually going to face, they would have the joy of knowing that Jesus was with them, praying for them, that He has given them help, the other comforter. He was going to work all these things together for their good. He wanted them to have joy. He said earlier in chapter 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Why isn't that true? But take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus spoke in their hearing, prayed in their hearing so that they would have peace and so that they would have joy. And the fact that when they went out and met the opposition, which he told them they were going to face, that they would have peace and joy and courage. Now, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you can also have the joy of knowing that he is in heaven praying for you, as I've said, and that because he is, there is nothing in heaven or earth that can ever take you away from him. You can know that you're going to make it to heaven. You can know that you're going to persevere to the end, that you won't fall away because He will preserve you. The reason why this prayer is in the Bible is many reasons, but not the least of which is Jesus wanted you to know that He's praying for you, and He wanted you to know what He was praying for you, and He wanted you to believe that what He was praying for you was something that, that the Father was going to answer and actually do for you so that you could have fullness of joy. You know, the Lord has done what He has done so that He might glorify His name, that He might glorify His name in our salvation, but He has also done these things and He reminds us of these things constantly so that while we are in this world doing His work, we might actually have joy. We don't have to be like Peter after Jesus was crucified and they went out looking for the disciples and so forth. And he was afraid for his life, and he was in a dark room with the doors closed, afraid that they were going to find him. We don't have to live that kind of life. We don't have to hide our light under a bushel. We don't have to be ashamed. We don't have to be afraid of any of these things because Jesus prays for us and that because we are going to make it to the end. The world cannot take away our lives. Um, our sin is not going to overcome us. We are going to persevere because the Lord is preserving us. And because that's true, we can have joy. And again, let's not forget why that's true. It's, it's true because of what Jesus Christ has done, because of what the table reminds us of this morning. Jesus became a man without giving up His deity. He lived that life God commanded us to live, but which we failed to live. He laid down His life so that He might cleanse those who would trust in Him 
of their sins. He was raised again to life and ascended to heaven. He's at the right hand of the Father, interceding and pleading the merits of His life and of His death on our behalf so that we will never perish. Now, Jesus can never fail in that work of intercession for us. He will never cease to do that until all of His people are safely in heaven. And that's the reason why we will not perish. That's the reason why we're here to begin with. And that's the reason why one day this worship that we're giving to Him on earth will one day be you know, brought to heaven and we'll be able to worship Him there. We can know it's true because of what Jesus has done. So let's prepare ourselves now to come to the table and to remember Jesus, to remember His death, to remember His resurrection, and to remember His intercession. And let's take a few moments as we... Um, are preparing to come to the table to, again, examine our lives based upon what we've just seen? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you repenting of your sins? Are you following Him? Are you turning from the world? And are you willing to do what He calls you to do in the face of a world that actually is hostile towards Him? <clears throat> if you are, this table is for you because what Jesus did he has done for you. Well, let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's prepare ourselves.